side of your life is any hood. For those of you who cannot wait and love daddyhood, please head over to our Patreon. We have exclusive access to episodes. We have early access to episodes and we have behind the scenes footage. Head on over there, sign up, be part of the exclusive daddyhood group and join us over there. Welcome back to daddyhood. We are on my path to parenthood. We are in New York City, thanks to Peer Space who is our location sponsor today. So I'm excited to get into this episode. Today I am joined by the points guy, Brian. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Um, We have a lot to get into. Before we do so, I've been working on my dad jokes. Uh Uh-oh. So (laughs) gird your loins. Let me test this on you. So Brian, how did the cell phone ask his girlfriend to marry him? I don't know, how? He gave her a ring. (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's good. Oh, so good. See, a little dad joke moment. Thank you. Your journey has been something that I've had a lot of interest in because I remember saying to myself at a very, very young age, you know, I can just become a dad on my own. And I think there's something so cool about that. And I can't wait to get into your story. Thanks. Yeah, I've taken a lot of trips in my life, but I have to say like the path to being a dad has been the most epic journey I've ever taken. And I'm excited to talk about it with you. Yeah. Well, that's going to be being a dad is going to be anything that I'm about to go over in your bio. So here we go. Um, Brian Kelly is the founder of The Points Guy, the trusted travel media platform that has revolutionized the travel and loyalty industries through expert insight, innovative technology and acclaiming rankings. From his beginnings in finance, Brian has used his experience and passion to transform TPG from a personal blog to an unrivaled media powerhouse with over 11 million monthly visitors, a full team of contributors, contributors, and the introduction of a TPG app. Dubbed the man who turned credit card points into an empire by the New York Times, Kelly's dynamic personality, deep industry knowledge, and extensive global travel have inspired millions to make their dreams a reality. I mean, nicely put. <laughs> very nicely put. <laughs> that kind put. of sums it up. That but. totally sums it up. Um, and we could definitely talk about points too somewhere yeah. in this. And I know you just took well, a especially, trip with your son trust too. Trust me, to anyone who thinks they're going to become a parent, like this is an expensive process, which we'll get into. And very. there's a lot of ways to put things on your credit card. Yes. And then once you have kids, your expenses quadruple. So uh, yeah, we can talk all about how to maximize points because... I've trapped my son is now 16 months and he's been to 12 countries. Okay. So, and that's a whole nother ball game where once you have kids, you, I, I thought, oh, kids fly free because they're sitting on your lap, right? right? But I just had to pay $2,300 to have my son sit on my lap going to Tokyo. Okay. Because it, some airlines charge 10% of the fee and I use points to fly first class. So I had to pay 10% of a $23,000, what it would have cost to buy. Got it. Was there an option for you to play points for no, that fee? No, nope. no. So you have to pay that exactly. fee. Exactly. So it was worth it because Japan Airlines first class is insanely right. good. But imagine the price shock when you have to pay $2,300 for a 30-pound baby to sit in your lap yeah. 14 hours to Japan. Yikes. Well, I mean, look, a barrier to entry, you know, it's it's not a lot of surprise to people out there, but it's very expensive to go yeah. through surrogacy and IVF. And I think like I've admitted like, you know, I obviously have blessings and the privilege to be going through what I'm going through. But yeah, I mean, I mean, I would love to talk through like how people could be strategic and planning their families and also the expenses that come along with IVF and IUI and all these different ways to become a parent. People can put it on their credit card. Yeah. Well, I, you know, and, Full disclosure, I only recommend people put stuff on their credit card when you can pay it off because if you're paying the yeah. interest, you're, the amount of points you get, right. you know, you're going to negate the value. But <clears throat> in general, I mean, planning for, for surrogacy, I mean, it was, it was the wild, wild west when I went through it. I thought I had really amazing health insurance. Come to find out it was like a month before the delivery and I had to cut a $40,000 check to the hospital because I realized that my baby wasn't covered under my insurance until he, he was out of the womb. Wow. And my insurance, because my surrogate, because I intentionally wanted to have this baby, would not cover it. If I had knocked up a random stranger, 100% covered. Yeah. But because it's a surrogate and I wanted to have this child, yep. that which I think is a form of discrimination, it's actually working its way through the courts. There's a court case in New York yeah. where um, you know public employees are discriminated against health insurance-wise. If they want to have a baby, surrogacy is not included when... 
IVF and other treatments for straight couples are 100% included. Yeah. So there's still a lot of inequality in the in the marketplace. But for people starting out, I would say the first thing is go to your HR. We actually ended up at my parent company. I also, due to my position of power, I was also able to kind of push them to cover more things. They had never had a single gay father go through surrogacy. And there were just a lot of gaps in coverage. And what I would recommend to people, even if you're not the CEO of your company, sit down with your HR. Like people in HR, a lot of the time, don't understand when coverage gaps exist because they've never experienced it. And I used to be in HR when I was in finance. You know, your HR reps do wanna help you. So I would say first thing is just go on a fact-finding mission. What is gonna be covered with your insurance? and sometimes even your primary health insurance, I know at my company it's called Progeny, it's like a side service. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So it's it's confusing, but like go on a fact-finding mission to see what, you know, sometimes they'll cover IVF related, freezing your embryos. It's a lot, but just try to figure out like what your policies cover. And, um, and then otherwise, yeah, it's put together a financial plan because it is not for the faint of heart, this surrogacy, process it can and the costs can vary widely you know where you do it in the u.s and certainly if you can go abroad the prices can drop dramatically yeah. but that of course comes with its own risks that yeah. you know you should always weigh when deciding what path makes sense for you yeah i remember i was just so shocked because i'm with sag and you would think yeah you would think you know being with sag we would have great benefits um which we do in other ways yeah. no, nothing was covered yeah um we actually had to take out a special insurance policy just yep. for our surrogate um and everything else is out of pocket for yeah. and, and including most of her doctor visits too and i don't yeah. think people really realize that so yeah. it's yeah. uh yeah even i mean it varies by state yes, so even when you're going yes. through your surrogacy matching process like certain surrogates act their their health insurance will cover a lot some won't no matter what you're gonna have to take out extra insurance and coverage yep. but um but yeah the the process can be extremely expensive and um you know I, people should just understand any good surrogacy agency should outline and put and tell them look at the full like life cycle of the process when you're going to need money at certain points because you never want to be halfway through the process and feel we're like out of money. we're out of yeah. money yeah yeah i remember that was like we Jordan and I had a conversation with our lawyer and also just the doctor and was like, map this out for us. Mm -hmm. How much is this going to cost? Where are benchmarks? What are we looking at for like from start to finish? And now we've been on this for shoot a little under two years. We've been on, on our, on our journey and you know, still we'll get, we joke about it at this point, but like (laughs) we'll just be out to dinner and be like, Oh, there's another $5,000 charge that just came through. And yeah, like, do we even I have, get a heads up? I have an escrow account, uh, and it would always just ding me. You're under five thousand. I'm like, I just replenishment. Like, how every day? And I'd be like, How much do I need to put in here? It just kept anytime you go below five thousand, which was like every single day. But yeah, yeah. I, I, we, I was like, Can we go a week without someone asking us for another chunk of money? Yeah, like it is a very expensive process. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in, in what motivated you because what, yeah. at what age did you become a father? So I was 39. So my goal is to always become a dad. Ideally, I was like, I want to become a dad in my 30s, yeah. right? So for me, my journey was really interesting. So I started the Point Sky when I was 27. I was in New York. I had come out at 22, was living in the city, just discovering myself. And then my journey as the Point Sky was really wild. I was making no money with it. And then it just blew up overnight. I liken my experience a lot to like winning the lottery in a way. Yeah. It just became. What was that ch- the game changing moment for you? The game changing moment was like, so I had the points guy was a blog. It was kind of pot. It was like, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 monthly readers. I was still yeah. working my HR cubicle job at Morgan Stanley. But um, my friend was like, you should do affiliate marketing. The credit card companies will pay you. And I always joke, like I was blogging on a gold mine. So I'm sitting here talking about American Express, Chase, get this card, get that card. And my friend actually came to me from college and was like, I work for this affiliate marketing company. And dude, you're writing about all these credit card companies. You should be using our affiliate link. Um, the company is now called Rakuten, which is like the biggest affiliate yes, you know, network familiar. in the world. So this is 2011. I had no idea what affiliate marketing was. I thought it was, I was like, it's too good to be true. Yeah. But no, I literally just started using their links and my readers trusted me. And so you know, I would write about a credit card and bam, so it's like the first month was 5,000. And then the next month, this is when my, 
the New York Times ended up writing a piece about the points guy. I'd met with their uh, budget travel columnist and I changed his mind about points. He was always, a, he wasn't a believer. So he yeah. wrote this New York Times article, April of 2011. I remember exactly where I was. I didn't even know if it would come out. Cause when you meet with journalists, especially as a nobody, yeah, and it was the points guy, like the number one travel website you need to read right now. So my site blew up and it was a day that there was like this 100,000 point chase offer. That day I made a hundred grand. Wow. So it was like, and then from that point, it was like, you know, a million bucks within six months. It was, it just wild. So all off affiliate, all off affiliate. And then it just kept skyrocketing. Um, so I sold it in 2012 to a publicly traded company. And I've since I still work for the points guy it has changed hands another time. So it has been this wild ride. I wouldn't change anything for the world, but I'm a traveler. So I wanted to travel the world. I'm the CEO of this growing business. Yep. You know, I started doing media myself. So I knew in my early 30s, especially, I was just, I was all over the place. I was having a lot of fun, I'm not gonna lie, but I was not fit to be a father. Like, I always knew I wanted to be, and I mean, I wanted to be a dad. It's just like in my blood, I guess. Yeah. I like, as a little kid, I always just knew I'd be a dad. And that was my biggest conflict with being gay. My family's super supportive. I always knew that they would be. I think deep down my biggest shame was that I wouldn't be able to do my biggest you know, goal, which was to become a dad. Mm. So it was this whole conflict. And even in my 20s when I was out, but then I started seeing friends, you know, in the gay community. Um, like one of my close friends had twins. He was single gay dad with twins. Um, and he was such a, I looked at it and he lived in, a, in the West Village in a fourth floor walk up. And I'm like, how the hell are you doing this? But he did it and he thrived and his kids were and are amazing. And that to me was like, okay, I knew it was possible. Yeah. But even for him, I think his surrogate was in Kansas and when his kids were born and a jerk in the uh, the, the local uh, court wouldn't sign the birth certificates. Wow. He was held for like a month in Kansas fighting. They eventually, he knew he would win, but yeah. you know, there's just an ass that wanted to make his life hell. And that has, I've heard that story so many times. So it really, you know, and while surrogacy today, there's still a lot more protections, it's still, a little bit of the wild, wild west. And For certainly sure. looking at the political climate and how quickly things can change, like, you know, especially now with Roe v. Wade being overturned, you know, that now plays differently into what states a lot of people are comfortable, yep. you know. So in any case, long story short, it was the pandemic. That's when the pandemic hit. I was in a, I was engaged to be married. The relationship was not meant to be. And we broke up. It was like, March 5th of 2020, and just so happened a global pandemic hit. I look at life like everything happens for a reason. I'm like not traveling. I, it was like the universe took me and said, Brian, let's hit the reset button. And I know a lot of people had this too, and I know how terrible the pandemic was, but truly for me, it was like the biggest blessing in my life. I couldn't yeah. travel if I wanted to. I'm home, I rescued my dog, I'm spending time with family. Unlike a lot of people, I got fit during the pandemic. I didn't really drink. I was in nature. Like it was this whole, I felt like this new Brian being reborn. And like my friend always says, like never waste a crisis. Mm -hmm. So the pandemic for me was like, and, I, and going to therapy, which I really started doing in earnest after that breakup, when I kind of at first thought my life's falling apart, my relationship, I'm supposed to, you know, in my head, and I think a lot of us do this checklist of, okay, I'm successful here, I'm at business, let me get married, let me have kids, and we're all trying to do this checklist that I think has been ingrained in a lot of us, like what this life should look like. Yeah. And then in going through therapy and just realizing, I had this aha moment, like I can be, I'm fortunate enough to have the financial means to have help, I'm fortunate enough to be able to do the process the way I wanted to. And so I started in earnest. It was like November of 2020. And then my son was born October of 22. So it was like just under two years from start to finish, which yep. is actually pretty quick. Yeah. All things considered. I mean, look, I'm right there with you. I came out over the pandemic. So what a lot of people view as as chaotic as that was it was the biggest blessing in, yeah. in my life too because it forced me to stop running yeah and i was like okay this is the time the universe is telling me like i've hit my wall in my lowest point like yeah. i need to you know come out and one of the main things that kept me in the closet was similar to you is i mean obviously i, I played sports so that the athletic community was not an easy one and football locker rooms is not yeah. easy to come out i grew up 
in the Catholic church. And so my religion played a factor into it. And then my third one was my goal and dream to become a dad. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it was possible. I I didn't want to look in the direction of being gay or research. And I didn't really know what went into becoming a father Mm -hmm. as a gay man. So I just assumed it wasn't possible. And so it's, and have it's you always known, like when you were a little kid, were you like, I'm going to be a dad one day? Yeah. yeah. I, I remember, uh, I, we had our, our teacher asked us, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I wrote down an NFL player and she, she told me to go redo that. And she's like, choose something more realistic. <laughs> and I went back to my desk and I wrote stay at home dad. And cause like that was a goal and a yeah. dream of mine. Yeah. And, um, I still joke with my husband that I'm going to yeah. <laughs> quit working and become a stay at home dad. But, uh, it's, it's definitely been you know, going through this process and has been transformative for me. I mean, that's what obviously inspired all of this too. But I think I would have been similar if I hadn't met Jordan, Mm -hmm. I would have been like, okay, I want to start doing this on my own. It would have been something that I would have pursued whether I was in a relationship or not. And I mean, I couldn't think of doing this without him because I mean, it's nice. And, and this, I'm getting to the second question for you, the follow up on that. Who did you look to for support? Because I know for me, I, I had received the news that like, I didn't have high sperm count and I had mm-hmm. to work on my fertility. And it was like, this journey is very up and down yeah. where they're like, you have a surrogate and then you don't, and then you're egg donor, but then there's genetic testing and it didn't turn out the way that you were hoping because you're not a match. Yeah. And there's ups and downs and heartbreak. Yeah. Who did who did you look to so, for support with that? So I, my parents are amazing. My parents are like my best friends. They've been together almost 50 years. They have instilled like, they're just amazing people. And, and over the pandemic, I spent more time with them than I ever had before and really deepened my relationship with them. So as I was going through this process, you know, I'm single in my 30s living in this farm town in, in Pennsylvania, which was like the best thing for me, but yeah. it at times was a little bit isolating for sure. Um, but I knew this moment of like, well, I'm not dating, like let's put my, let's put this time to use. Yeah. And I, and I, I think I also just like, I've realized like we're, I'm very independent. Like I can do this. Yep. I had my vision. I knew it would be a challenge, but I, I think I'm also just programmed, like just do it, you know, like, um, so I relied a lot on myself and I really just go back to therapy. I have an amazing therapist that I has helped change my life and change. <clears throat> and in preparation of becoming a dad, you know, in, in addition to getting fit, cutting out some people in my life that probably weren't going to be aligned with, and it's okay to like, there's, there was, there's been an entire evolution of the people in my inner circle. Less is a whole lot more, especially when you're a parent, that's like, I think one of the biggest blessings that comes, it gives you such clarity. Like time is so important mm. that you don't want to, like you don't have that, you know, those friends who push you to hang out that you don't want to actually hang out with, but you don't have the balls to say no to. Now when you have the baby, it's like, get out of here, no way. And those people, it's going to be a little bit of a conflict, but like naturally, like fatherhood for me was, it's like, yes, I brought my son into this world, but I also like was reborn myself, I yeah. think a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, I relied a lot on myself, my therapist. I mean, I have a great group of friends. I have gay parent friends. Interestingly, a lot of my gay parent friends, like they reached out, were like uh, very much open to be resources. But once I got into the process, and for me, I think my biggest tip to people, I, I my doctor, my physician had re- recommended me a woman who ran a small surrogacy agency. We were not a fit. I just didn't like her. Yeah. You know, she didn't, she was responding to questions to me, like really like, you don't know the basics of, and I I was like, I'm new to this. I don't even know what like menstrual cycles and like timing. And she would just respond really like nasty, like Brian, babies aren't grown overnight. And I'd be like, Oh no. So that was not a match in the end though. The blessing with her is she got me with my IVF doctor. And what I recommend to people where to start, you know, if you have, you know, friends who have done this, get recommendations, but interview a bunch of IVF doctors who focus on LGBTQ families. You really want to get an IVF doctor that you trust. And the best IVF doctors have the connections to surrogacy agencies, to yep. egg agencies, all of that. So I use Dr. Donna Schman, who's a world renowned um, IVF doctor in San Diego incredible clinic. I loved his entire team from day one. I felt at home. 
I got great information. <clears throat> so I would recommend to people like get your IVF doctor. If you're looking just yeah. and interview them and see who you really feel connected to. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and I don't know, my doctor and I had a really great relationship. You know, then you just think the big decisions are choosing an egg donor, yeah. which for me was like, it's a fascinating process. I remember just going into my like, my, uh, I have like a, <clears throat> a movie theater in my basement and I would have like airplay up on the egg donor agency and you can sort by pretty much everything. Yes. <laughs> I remember those days very well. And it was kind of fun. It's also, it's really like, it kind of shakes you to your core, like this is kind of crazy that I'm able to do this and yep. it pushes you like what's most important to you, you know, the pedigree, the education. That had to be fun to do solo. Cause I, it, as when you're in a relationship, it's, it was interesting. So many people I've talked to in relationships really have challenges with this. Like I know yeah. a lesbian couple of mine is like, they've been delayed for over a year. And meanwhile, I'm like, you're not getting any younger girls like, yeah. and they want to carry naturally. Yeah. I'm like, just, at a certain point, you just gotta pick something. You cannot over-engineer right. it. And by the way, like these profiles we're reading, they're not medically vetted. Like <clears throat> you hope people are honest in their questions, but totally. at the end of the day, this is a trust-based process. Um, and you can't like over-engineer it. You gotta, so. I kept reminding myself, that, that was something that I kept saying to not only myself, but to Jordan as well, as I said, I, I don't wanna play God. Mm -hmm. So like as much as yes, we're paying a lot of money for this. So like, let's be strategic yeah. and like, let's talk about what's important to us as we're like making these decisions, yeah. but we're not, I'm not like building a baby in a lab. Like, yeah, yeah. I definitely, we both believe in nurture over nature yeah. and we want to just make sure our baby is in a loving home. That's yeah. like the number one important thing to us. But I could imagine you know, did, did, was there anybody that you were like letting into your decision or did oh, you Oh yeah, like my solo? best friends, I would okay. I would like open up to them and just, I'd ask them You'd their like, feedback. like, what do you think but, of these two? <clears throat> but like I knew I'm, I will make all decisions in my life. Yeah. Like I'll ask people for help. Even my parents, I think my parents are still a little, I mean the whole process is really, and one thing, my parents are very supportive and amazing, but it's a lot. I think for yeah. what I would tell people, like coming out as gay now is kind of normal, but like this whole parenting process, people will have opinions on it and it's okay. Like yeah. you just have to be so like convicted to what you're doing that like you can t just tune out that noise and go with your gut. And that's, so I, you know, back to like who I trusted, it's like my parents were helpful, but I really did this process myself and I yeah. knew I made the right decision my doctor, you know, you, you really just want to go, what's going to like give this embryo the best chance. So I did sure. all the genetic testing. And so did you do mock cycle with your surrogate and stuff? I did not No, okay. <clears throat> my surrogate was amazing. So I won the surrogacy lottery. I love, I like to think we did, but so my, sur <laughs> my surrogate, she was a lesbian uh, yeah, based in California, which is great for like everything uh, California, like the legal work and everything. California is a very friendly state to LGBT okay. people. She was vaccinated. We saw eye to eye on a lot of things and she had done surrogacy twice before and had one baby of her own. So this was her fourth natural birth. She was in her late twenties, all uncomplicated wow. pregnancies. And so to me, that's just like, you know, when you're looking for surrogates, you just that want very someone who's had, yeah. who's done yeah. this a bunch of times. And like, she's like a, pro at giving birth. So she was awesome. She actually came to my son's first birthday party. That's incredible. Her and her, um, her wife and her two kids. And that was the moment I just lost it. I just started sobbing uncontrollably, oh. like seeing she had seen my son on, you know, day one and two in the hospital, but yeah, that was really special. Just, I to, hope everyone <clears throat> feels like they win the surrogacy. Lottery. Yeah. Cause like it truly is such a special moment. And uh, I don't know. I mean, as you're like going through it to have like the relief of knowing you pick somebody that feels good yeah. and like is like weirdly an extension of your family at, at a certain yeah. point. Like, and I would, I, as a, a piece of advice. So there will come a point when you finally have embryos when you're like, okay, let's get a surrogate. Let's get a surrogate. The whole surrogacy process can be very time consuming. You know, the major surrogacy companies when I was going through it in 21, were like, it's gonna be two to three years. You may match, you may not. So you kind of, it's like you can finally get embryos and then yeah. you may have to wait a long time. We were on a wait list for six months. Yeah. So, but we started our, I remember like as we were going through 
um, as we were finalizing our egg donor, they were like, okay, now you need to start putting your name on the wait list yep. for surrogates. Absolutely. And I was like, already? Absolutely. Get on. Some of the biggest agencies have like really long wait times. And of course, here I am. I'm like, I'm used to my airline elite status. How do I skip the line? I want yeah. priority. And the, the, the agencies uh, were like, um, Brian, it doesn't work that way. This is like human life. You can't just skip to the front of the yeah. line. I'm like, really? But um, there's funny enough, there are, so there's like major surrogacy agencies. Then there's a bunch of smaller companies. I ended up using Elevate Baby. Mm -hmm. They are gay owned. Um, the, um, the CEOs are gay men. They have a beautiful baby girl and they have a smaller agency. And I was actually connected to them through social media and they reached out to me after I was open about the process and were like, we actually think we have this perfect surrogate for you. Wow. So what I could say is the power of social media can change your life in a lot of ways. I don't recommend for everyone finding a surrogate via Instagram, but for me it worked out and the surrogate was amazing. So, but back to getting in line. So your surrogate, I think a lot of times you're like, okay, I just want a healthy surrogate, like let's go. But you really do wanna have someone that you are connected with, that you're on the same page with. I, I know it wasn't until, it's kind of halfway through the pregnancy, we started to go through the birthing plan. Yeah. I actually, I wanted to be in the room. I, for me, it was very important to have, I wanted to be the first person my son was on. I did not, I had a friend who was a doula and she was like, no, don't let them even weigh your son or do anything. He goes straight from the womb onto your mm. chest. So I was like, that sounds amazing. <clears throat> So my surrogate was very cool with that. But like talk about these things in the interview because you don't want to be surprised later yeah. when you're like, oh, wait a minute, this would be really important to me. And then that surrogate's like, sorry, I'm going to have my husband in the room and we're going to give you the baby yeah. later. Like that's a pretty big thing that's going to- I'm actually having a doula on tomorrow. We're, I so would highly recommend to everyone to get a doula um, just to understand what the woman goes through that day. Yeah. It, I had a couple sessions before the birth. It was very, very helpful. And the day of my- so I was fine with just, you know, doctor delivers the baby hands to me. The day of my son's uh, uh, birth, the doctor was a different doctor. He was younger and cool. And he looked at me, he's like, he's like, you don't seem squeamish. Do you want to deliver your baby? And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? And he asked my surrogate and she was like, yeah, fine with me. So I literally like pulled my son out. Yeah. It was so freaking cool. Um, that's awesome. Like, like life changingly cool. I just like, and all the nurses in the hospital were all, they had never seen a single gay man. They're like, this is so inspiring. She's like, Aww. she's like, you, you don't know how many like times birth is like not a happy thing for families. And like, they're like your love. They're like, it's, it's really special. Like the nurses were crying and all around me. It was like, so sweet. there's, it was, and my surrogate's wife was in the room. She actually recorded the whole thing. So I have, I have that like special moment. So back to choosing a surrogate, you really want to get someone that you vibe with. Yeah. And I didn't realize it. I mean, you really want someone who has a stable life, um, has security. Like you don't want them to be stressing a lot. Cause I didn't really realize that a lot of friends I've talked to since was, there's a lot that can happen during gestation. That's always a hard word for me to say. We don't really know the impact of stress environment while the baby's in the womb. Like, yes, most of it's genetics, but also like there is apparently research is coming out like the environment in which your baby's in the womb, there are a lot of unknowns into like, yep. so, but most doctors that I talked to are like, yeah, you generally want your surrogate to be in a very stable environment, not like, for example, not going through a divorce or which I actually have a friend that happened to, he chose a surrogate wow. and they ended up divorcing. It was kind Midway of way through the, yeah, oh, wow. very stressful situation. So sometimes you can't foresee it, but, um, but yeah, you ideally uh, want to choose someone who's got like a lot of decisions. And a lot, like, that was the one thing that I remember is like, there's so many decisions that you have to make throughout this process. Yeah. It is a little overwhelming at times just with like at every step, there's another decision to, yeah. to make. Um, and I know obviously we hit on the positives and all the excitement. What were some of the challenges that you went through and, and was there any specifically or particularly challenging just being a solo dad? Yeah. Well, I mean, big challenges. I am super fortunate. The process was really beautiful and I, it wasn't even a challenge. My, I, so my surrogate, because this was her fourth baby being delivered, yeah. uh, 
and I'm a big guy and I, my baby was big. I knew he would be big. He was like, I think almost nine pounds, but like really wide, poor surrogate. <laughs> she still the will women. remind me of that. She's like, I had an epidural and I still felt. These are incredible deep. women. Yeah. Let's like just throw saints. that out there. I, I've always respected women, but watching a woman give birth like front row, like seeing what the female body is capable of is like, my mind is blown. So overall, like there were no real dark moments. My son almost came, I was in LA. My, so my surrogate was based outside of LA. She went into, she thought she was like eight centimeters dilated. Oh wait, maybe I'm getting it wrong. I think she was four centimeters. She thought she was going into labor like okay. three weeks early. So I flew out to LA, I had a house in LA, I'm excited. And then I think she was four or five or six centimeters dilated. Not enough to be admitted. Yeah. But, and then for three weeks, he was just there. Like he didn't want to come. So I, for three weeks, I was like going to sleep every night, like double, triple, quadruple checking my phones on. Ready to go. You know, making sure her number like, will wake me up because I wanted to be in that room so bad. So it was like three weeks of like constant anxiety thinking, like just staring at my phone, like, did she call? Did it, you know? Yep. But it was also like three weeks for me to, I was in, I rented a house in Montecito and just did Orange Theory and slept and was like the healthiest I've ever been. I, I kind of knew, it's like, I just want to be the healthiest version of myself for when my son comes. Cause I know everything's going to go out the window, especially those first, weeks after birth are just such a whirlwind in the most amazing way. Yeah. So I really can't say that there were like, you know, my, I had one egg donor that didn't work out cause she had lied about using nicotine and mm -hmm. that was like a bummer and set me back a couple months, but egg donor surrogate <clears throat> egg donor. Okay. Got it. So I was set. She did her cycle. We had all these eggs or no, no, actually she didn't even do the cycle because they were like, Oh, sorry. She tested positive. For nicotine. And then I'm like, if she's lying about that, what else is she lying? Oh. So I said no, and then went with another one. And so it was like a three month delay, but it wasn't the end of the world. Yeah. yeah. And I'm lucky I got, I think I, with this, the egg donor that I went with, I got like almost 30 eggs. Wow. That's really good. We got 22. Um, I think we, 15 embryos. I did genetic testing. Wow. And in the end, you know, in genetic testing, they will rank, mm -hmm. you know, A plus quality. And the higher rank is the better odds, you know. Yep. So, if you do genetic testing and you have high quality embryos, like generally they say you want to have three embryos for every baby you want to have. Like, but if you genetic test, it's my doctor was like, it's really like 85% success rate. If yeah. you, if you know you've got, which was fascinating to me and uh, that so many embryos are just never meant. Right. And you know, and which is why we see so many people have miscarriages, like yeah. that some are just yeah. never meant to, to happen. So the beauty of genetic testing is you can increase your odds dramatically. <clears throat> So I luckily, I got lucky the first, uh, so I ended up with like seven very high quality embryos and the first transfer worked. So I, I feel very fortunate throughout the whole process. Like I got, I feel very fortunate, amazing surrogate, incredible birth experience, yeah. healthy baby. First and foremost, that's the only thing you really care about. He was on term nine pounds, healthy. Amazing. We flew home three days later. <clears throat> Back to New York? Back to New York. What a flight to start. Yeah, I, for, I'm fortunate enough, I splurged on a, a plane because yeah. the, my doctor is like, if you can, you know, you wanna not have your three day old on a commercial. On a commercial. It's not the yeah. end of the world. I mean, plenty of people do it. Right. And for people who do fly, we recommend you sit towards the front of the plane, window seats for the baby, put like the air nozzles on. You just wanna like, and have right. your, you can board, but have your baby board last. And the further you are up front on the plane, the quicker you can get off. It's yeah. so really during boarding is that like, you, you don't want them around a bunch of people, but Especially babies are pretty boards. resilient. You know, yeah. if your baby's healthy, like you're probably gonna be fine. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some like fun memories that you've already created as a single dad. Um, do you have like a ongoing ranking list? I mean, I know what, your son is 16 months. He's so 16 months. 16 I, months worth of, I Memories. have to say, I love, I've loved every phase. Um, the beginning I took, I think I took, I took three months. I took three months paternity. I took two months in the beginning. That's another thing I recommend to people. If you have, if you can split up your paternity or maternity. I highly recommend it. Cause in the very beginning, I mean, they just sleep all day long. Yeah. I mean, sleeping, what which is life. great. And like, you know, nice to bond with them, but like they have no idea what's going on. Right. 
So what I found, I took a month when I turned, I turned 40 last March. I spent a month in Portugal to her 40th birthday and I was with my son and he was six months old then. And so he was much more with it. So having an extra month when he was much more interactive was really cool. So if you can split your paternity, maternity like that, that can be, but just traveling with him. I mean, I just took him to Tokyo. He's just a little munchkin. I took him to a micro pig cafe and, what is um, a micro pig cafe? Micro pig cafe is just like you basically pay and you go and sit on the floor and there's little mini pigs that run around and they come on your lap. And, you know, Tokyo is known for these weird cafes. You can go to owl cafes. Where you can have coffee with like owls, owls. Wow. cat cafe. Originally it was cat cafes. Yes. And now they have to like one up themselves. So a friend was like, so I think just traveling with him and I've been a lot of places in the world, but seeing the world through his eyes, actually, I will say one of the most magical was take, I took him to Disney Sea, which is the theme park in Disney. And going to a Disney in Tokyo, Disney park in Tokyo is fascinating. It's clean, it's inexpensive, it's yeah. orderly. It is amazing food. It's like very different than the US. The and, opposite um, of the US. <laughs> you said it, not me, no. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, and I took him on his first ride. We were like in this little mermaid underwater world and it was a jellyfish that just like popped up and down. And I just remember the first time he said, whoa. So cool. And he's on my lap and I'm just like, this is it. Like this, yeah. just like look at him and every day just, I see little dimples for me. Like you, you watch them grow in real time almost. And it's so true. Yeah. Every, every parent said to me, you know, the days are long, but the years are fast. Yeah. And that is so true. You look back. Yeah already 16 months. But every phase is so cute. He's talking. I mean, he started walking really early. And now just he's piecing together sentences. Yeah. Oh my, it's just like, it's delicious. What is, um, does he call you dad, dada? Dada. Yeah, dada. for the most part, he's like dada. Um, and his first language is Spanish. So. Another thing, I mean, we haven't discussed, but like, especially as a single gay dad, like I will not, I don't, I never pretend to do this all on my own. So I have the most incredible nanny. Um, she's from Guatemala. She was a former teacher. Her kids are grown. So this is another yeah. thing, choosing nannies and baby nurses. These will also be huge decisions. Totally. I had never had live in help before in my life. So when someone is helping you raise your child and living in with you, it's a lot. So the person, you know, I've been through several nannies that were not fits. They were either not a fit for my baby or for me. And what I'll say is in the beginning as a, a gay man, I was like, well, I know nothing about childhood. These are the experts. Yeah. But when you become a parent, like you get a gut feeling that you know what your child needs. Mm -hmm. I had this old school baby nurse. <clears throat> my son's big. He eats a lot. He's healthy, but he eats a lot. And as a baby, she could not fathom that he was eating like over six ounces in a sitting. But he was hungry and he's a yeah. big boy. He's 93rd yeah. percentile. And she would stop feeding him and he would start crying and she'd be like, no, it's, he, he needs to be burped. And I'm like, girlfriend, he's hungry. And she, I would see the log and she would stop feeding him. And we, uh. lo and behold, I went to the doctor and he's like, yeah, Dean isn't where he needs to be at two weeks. So I sat down, I was like, and she continued to not, she was, it was inconceivable. So I'm like, you've got to go. And yeah, this you know, is not right. so it's like, and she was a lifelong baby nurse. So yeah. what I will say to any of the parents out there, you know, especially gay men where we're like, we don't know what the heck we're doing. You actually will develop a gut sense and connection and you'll learn like what your son needs and you must like every decision I make now is in his best interest. So don't be afraid to speak up and yeah. you may have to go through a couple nannies or a couple baby nurses, but don't let your need of desperation for the help override like what your child needs. And when you finally find the right person, do whatever it takes to keep them happy, yeah. pay them more than they're worth. You know, my nanny, the main one who travels with me, she wants to travel the world. She's like, and she's so cool with me. She's yeah. like a mom to me. So I love having, we have coffee in the morning. Like that's great. So yeah, finding the right. But once help. again, another decision to make. So there's there's just so many decisions <clears throat> as you go through this. I yeah. mean, it's But go with your gut. I mean, at yeah. the end of the day, I love that. How has he changed your life? I think he's changed my life. I actually I think he's given me like even I think I've gotten even more into my work and business and investing and like someone was like, "Well, are you going to want to kind of retire and slow down. And there's a piece of me that like 
my son and having him in my life, it gives me another focus now and like to work and to, to, to work even more. So I thought that I would kind of want to like slow things down and, yeah. but I don't know. He's given me this new exciting outlook on life and I just want to be the best role model for him. Yeah. And, and back to the, he's helped me realize the opportunity cost of life and like the riffraff, not to say riffraff, but that there are so many time sucks we all have in our lives, totally. like, and just cutting it out. Yeah. And like less is more. And just, he's just hysterical. Like the joy, it's indescribable. I love it. 10 out of 10 recommend. I, I absolutely love it. So what's next for you? What, uh, you know, obviously you accomplished baby number one on yourself. What, uh, what's next? Where are you going from here? So I think the biggest thing now is, do I want to give him a sibling? And I'm one of, I'm one of four kids. My mom is one of 10, mm -hmm. similar to you, big, like Irish Catholic or a family growing up. My, I have 11 nieces and nephews, so I have yeah. a huge family. Like that is my, like on my one side of the family, I've got almost 30 cousins. So I think I want to give him a sibling. So I'm kind of in the process there. I haven't made like the final decision, but we're, we're moving towards that. Incredible. I'm still single. I've been dating. That's dating while being a parent is a little bit challenging because like, and on one end, I, it, it's like a, it helps cut a large portion of people I out. I can imagine that. Which yeah. is great. Like, and I'm very upfront. Like, Less is I, more. I, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I know I th will probably take a little bit longer to find the right person now. I think my standards have risen dramatically. You know, I've dated a couple of people I thought were great, but then I was like, these are not role models for my child. Mm. Um, and it's like, that's a behavior I need to like, and I've been, I will always make the right decision. Like, so, um, are you, are me, you open if, if a partner wants to have children? For sure. I'd like love to have a big blended. DNA. Yeah. I'd love yeah. to have a big blended family. Like to me, more is more. So, but I'd also be open to a partner that doesn't want their own kids, but would be open to mine. I'm yeah. not looking for someone to like step in and play a parent role, like maybe yep. a long time down the line, but like, I definitely don't want to mess with I'm protective of like my son, especially now, you know, as a baby, he meets a bunch of people. He has no idea yeah. who anyone is, but like right. he's now picking things up pretty quickly. Do you have a rule? Um, is there like a three date, four date, five date rule of when you introduce? Yeah, your son I generally don't like introduce. Yeah, it wouldn't. I mean, I, I was dating someone. He met him. At, yeah, after like several dates, I don't have like a set rule. And when yeah. my son is young, like he, all he knows is this person's like a friend. Yeah. So yeah. I think that'll change as my son is like much more aware of like what's going on. But even so, like I think, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not like, I don't have like a set rule necessarily, but. Um, I, I mean, I think that's fine. Too. Yeah. Like it's just, it's a gut thing. You're yeah. just following your gut. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so I think I'm more focused on like, I think I'm going to have a second child. I think I just, well, my son is so perfect and fits so good in my life. Now, the part of me is like, don't mess it up. It's great. Yeah. But then the other part is I had siblings. I, I love my siblings. That's an experience that I want to give him. So I probably, yeah, probably most focused on that focused on my career. I'm writing a book and still traveling. So just trying to enjoy life, not to like over engineer it yep. and to have enough space to like enjoy with my son. Yeah. My brother and I are 18 months apart. And I think that was a, my brother and I are like two years. So, so you, if I get, if I get started soon, he's yeah, 16 you're like, months. Yeah. yeah. That's I, I was calculating in my head yeah. too. I was like, all right, this is how we have to plan this because yeah. I want 18 months apart. So, and I think once you get through the first one, it's just a whirlwind. You have no idea what to expect really. Like, yeah. And having 11 nieces and nephews, but having your own, it's nothing totally. and it's, yeah, it's a whirlwind. It's crazy. You have your sleepless nights, but you're like, I can do this again. I love but that. everyone who has two kids is like, trust me, it's, it's not like two is, you know, it's like easier. Like it, it's definitely when you've got two psychotic little things trying to like do dangerous uh, things, but I know I think I'm ready for it. Yeah. That was the, the big decision for us to not do twins. Was we yeah. Wanted I bond. definitely knew I didn't want twins. We, yeah. We wanted to bond with each of ours individually. And we, we had people encouraging us to do. Oh, no, twins. everyone who has twins highly recommend. They're I like, know. it's great when they're like four, they just play with themselves like right. built in nanny. You know, I'm like, just wasn't, nanny. I don't think it was for us. And yeah. it sounded like, yeah, we're on similar. My doctor there. wouldn't let me. He's like, cause I was a 10 pound baby. 
Oh yeah. And he's yeah. like, if you had twins, you like, we, there's a very high likelihood of like highly damaging. We had, um, one of our, the people who was helping build our, our fertility, they were on our fertility team, um, presented us with a surrogate. And we, I remember this vividly. Jordan and I looked at each other. We were reviewing the charts and her height. She was like four eight. <laughs> so we very kindly in an email were just like, "Hey, we just want to point out, like, yeah. I'm like six three, six four. Jordan six two. It's like this is probably going to be a big baby. Like, yeah. we need to like, uh, you know, reevaluate the surrogacy. Yeah. Uh, Although I will say, my surrogate was in low five feet, petite, but she. I mean, my my son was a challenge. Like yes, it was a yes, lot for yes. her, but like, but yeah, four eight might be pushing it. That's what we were thinking. But I would just say, listen to the, my, my, I, I almost like passed on her. My, my IVF doctor's like, Brian, it doesn't work like that. Your baby doesn't necessarily, isn't going to be necessarily big. But I'm like, actually, I'm pretty, all of my nieces and nephews were like yeah, nine yeah, pound yeah. babies. But, you, you know, trust the doctors, right? Yeah. Trust experts in it. Yeah. Um, well, this has been lovely. Thank you so much for coming on. Before you go, though, can you please leave us with some advice? Whether it's from parenting, somebody passed it down to you. What have you learned along the way? And it could tie into be a, a single dad or not. Well, whatever, I would say I just met a parent when I, I've been like on this, do I have a second? And she said to me very, so clearly, she had two, three children. And she said, love does not divide, it multiplies. So the more wow. babies you have, the more love you have. And you don't have to worry about not giving one attention. It just don't think that way. And I thought that was just so beautiful. So I love that. So yeah enjoy the process and i'll just say like when i hug my son and see him grow like there's just nothing else in the world like i've been to so many countries and stayed at fancy hotels and been to crazy experiences and but there's nothing like the bond and love of having your own child so if you want to do it if you're single it is possible yeah. if you know in your gut to do it and surrogacy is expensive, but there are plenty of other ways, adoption yep. um, that are not as expensive. And I will just say uh, Family Equality is a great organization um, that has a lot of resources for LGBTQ families. Yep. And I will end with, I love being around people who have done this is highly, um, like when you see what you're trying to model in your own life, it helps you. So. In Provincetown, which is one of my favorite places, yeah. I went last year to Family Week, yeah. which was so beautiful. I was supposed to be there. I'm so sad that I missed Go, it. I'm going again this year. It was just so beautiful to see. I didn't even do a lot of the events, but just like being with my son in a place where there's yeah. so many other families, it really, and I will say too, is go easy on yourself. You will, and there are times, like I still am like, am I messing up my son's life by not giving him a mother? And it's like just... You have to untune mm. all of that. Because I look at my son, he's healthy and happy and amazing and surrounded by love, and that is all that matters. So it takes time, go to therapy, but like get out of your head this notion of like this correct way to raise a family. There is none, you know, like, but giving your child love in a great environment um, is all that you need. Amen to that. And the New York sounds and sirens in the background, <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks I for having it. me and uh, good luck with your journey. Thank you. The ride of your life is steady.